Thanks so much, Mary. Well, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Josh Lundy Whitler, and I'm happy to moderate this session tonight um, or today, depending on where you are or uh, and what time it is in your particular time zone. Um, tonight, we are privileged to hear from three different scholars um, to talk about. Uh, well, the theme is listed as teaching hope amidst chaos, and we'll talk about whether or not that's the right kind of nails it on the head kind of theme here, or if maybe we want to change that a little bit, but. Um, that's uh, the listing of the, here for the, as kind of tying these, these papers together. And so what we're going to do, uh, um, I'll, I'll introduce the papers here for, in a second, but just to say that uh, we want to leave plenty of time for dialogue. Um, I think um, all the speakers here and uh, myself included would like to make sure that we have plenty of time for engagement. Um, we'll try to find opportunities for everybody to kind of either place uh, their questions in the chat that, so that, that way they feel like they can respond or to be able to raise their hand and, and share. So um, without further ado, just to, to start us off to say, um, we'll first hear if this is okay. I haven't really, we didn't really clarify the order here, folks. So sorry about that. But um, if it's okay with you, we'll start with Nanako Sakai, who is at Iona College. Um, and she is presenting a paper entitled, Ancestors are the Storytellers, the Realm of the Hungry Ghost and Hell in Buddhism. Uh, we have, Paul Houston Blankenship from Seattle University, who is presenting a pedagogy for the future when things are falling apart now. And we have Cesar C.J. Baldelomar from Boston College. And he's presenting Haunted by Our Ontological Ancestors, Prospects for Religious Education in Light of Necropolitics and Ontological Terror. So um, many very three very different works that we're looking at and there may we may not uh draw direct parallels between all three but i there's certainly some common themes which especially as we look at the theme of ancestry spiritual and physical and the interrelationship between those questions about identity questions about um questions about um sorry <laughs> Uh, questions about, um, I'm sorry, I lost my space. Here we go. Yeah, just the idea of, you know, talking about history and tradition and identity and contextuality, contextuality and legacy and power um, and many other themes that I have not named, but we have plenty of things to discuss. And so what we'd like to do is uh, open space for about 15 minutes. Um, for each paper, 15 plus maybe, and I'll try to keep time. Uh, speakers, if you can just kind of keep an eye on me and I will try to wave at you and say, speed it up. Or, you know, if, if I need to, if, if we need to keep an, I'll try to keep an eye on time and try to encourage it that way. Um, if I have to, I'll kind of go into the chat and do it, but um, I'll try to just do it through the camera more gently. <laughs> and that way, um, and then, We'll do about five minutes, and if so, if people while people are sharing, what I'd like you to do as you're listening, because we're going to try to be active during this conversation, if you all can, if, if we can just have at least one, uh, maybe two questions posed in the chat, um, if you have something come up while you're listening. So at least one or two questions from each presenter. If you all could come in, come in and bring a, a response, place it in the chat. And that way we will ask that question at the end of each 15. And that way we can uh, ask that quickly and then move on to the next presenter quickly. At the end of all three presentations and all three uh, very short Q&A, we'll then open the floor wide open so that everybody will have a chance to talk. And at that point, you can either raise your hand or present in the chat. And if you put it in the chat, I will share the question on your behalf. If you raise your hand, then you can speak yourself. So this gives everybody an opportunity to share and to share in the way that they feel comfortable and hopefully keeps things moving. So does everybody sound okay with that? Feel okay with that plan? Um, well, thank you all again for being here. And without further ado, um, we will open the floor to Nanako and listen to her presentation. Thank you, Josh. So my name is Nanako and I'm talking about uh, Buddhist health. So my, uh, it's in, I'm in Tokyo and it's nine, almost nine o'clock uh, in the morning. And my English has a very strong Japanese accent. So 
so uh, please be patient uh, my English. And I'm a visual person, so I provide uh, many visual images. So I try to uh, speak clearly, uh, but I apologize in advance uh, that my English is not so good. So I'll go to uh, share screen. I'll share screen and begin my presentation. Okay, so yes. Okay. So what does uh, Buddhist Inferno look like? I'm not sure how many of you know uh, Buddhist hell. So for students, imagination is important to understand diverse cultures and people, art, festivals, religious rituals, music, and food. So conversation with our ancestors enables us to discover the better path through the most profound intellectual quest. This word is by Gabriel Moran, uh, religious educators, educator. So the Ojo Yoshu, the essential of believers, is today's topic. So Ojo Yoshu was written by the Tendai school monk Genshin in 1985. So I think we have a familiar with the word uh, karma, but uh, I'd like to explain very briefly. Uh, karma means action, and karma refers to one's good and evil deeds, which result in pleasant or painful experiences in the future. So in this picture, the boys are trying to help uh, the dog, and which create very good uh, karma. So karma will manifest itself in the same way a mango appears on a mango tree. So karma is a moral action and responsibility that one should owe. So here's another keyword, samsara. Uh, it means the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth, because Buddhist believes rebirth. So when a person dies, karma accumulates this life and also past lives determine the forms of next life, unless one achieved nirvana. So uh, there are six realms. So where do we go after death? So the six realms of existence has three good one and three undesirable one. So the realms are gods, deva, ashra, called the demigods, and humans. And three lower ones are hungry ghost, animals, and hell. So the deva is uh, staying in the slums is very good uh, because it lasts for a long time, even eons, but it is still temporary. So someday it also uh, it is required to go to the other um, realm. So Ashura, demigods, or Jelius god. Ashura refers to the lower gods and often seen as evil mode of existence. So this is our world, our Manishra, our human realms. So being born as a human being in a healthy body, in a place where we can achieve, uh, we can receive spiritual teachings and evolve is very good, considered very auspicious. So we are encouraged uh, not to waste our precious time while uh, in this world. And animal realms are called the Kirak. So animals are ha lives harmony, live simply in harmony with nature, but uh, they are spending the whole day trying to catch food. Otherwise, they become food themselves. So it's still a very challenging realm. So the next one is hungry ghost called platers. So suffering the torment of hunger and other tortures. But when their bad karma, karma demerit runs out, they also can be born into another realm. And um, hungry ghost are people who did not have good faith and did not offer food and clothes to needy people while they were alive because of their greed. So there are other hungry ghosts who can only eat only incense, incense smoke, or just blowing wind. So 
So this is hungry ghost. And this is today's topic, uh, hell, Niraya. So the inhabitant of the hells suffer immeasurable torment for various different lengths of time. So today, I hope you do not have a nightmare um, because of the pictures that I showed you. So uh, be before explaining eight hells, I need to explain the kings of hell, 10 kings of hell. So the 10 kings are representative of hell and they're responsible for a set of seven days trials after this. And this is a real a pond in Aomori prefecture because of the minerals contains water, it looks like a uh, lead, lead color. So people call this pond as a hell pond. So the first hole of the day, which is seventh day after death. So uh, Shinko O is a judge who asks the dead man or women whether they had kept the five precepts while they were alive. And five precepts are not harming, not stealing, not lying, no sexual impropriety, and no intoxicants, which means no alcohol or no drug. And this is very common uh, precept uh, in religion. So after the first trial, people are required to cross the Sanzu River. So it is called the River of Three Crossings. So River of Three Crossings is a Japanese Buddhist tradition. So the dead must cross the river on the way to the afterlife, to the next life. So even now, uh, six coins are placed in the casket when the dead, uh, when the person dead during the funeral process. And this is a six coin. So I did not um, write about uh, this Tatsueva because of the uh, limitation of a paper, but there's an old man at the Sun's River and Tatsueva, she is called Tatsueva and she forces the dead to take off their clothes. And there's also an old man called Keneo hangs these clothes on the riverside branch and the branch bends to reflect the gravity of the scene. So it is like a scale how simple the person are, the person is. And this is Tatsueva's another painting. So she asked to, um, to strip the uh, clothes and put in the lunch. Okay, so the next one is 14th day, second hall. So Shokoo is a judge who is in charge of first precept, not harming or not killing. So he asked, have you cherished all sentient beings while you were alive? So the 21st day, the third hall of hell is Soteo. So he's a judge who is in charge of sexual misconduct or adultery. Okay, and I go to the next one. 28th day, uh, the fourth uh, hall of hell, Gokan O. He is in charge of uh, not lying. No religion said uh, to tell a lie is good, so which is very important. So fifth hall, this is 35th day after death. And there's an Emma O. Emma is the most well-known king of hell, and he shows all evil deeds of the dead man or women by using a special mirror. And this is a special mirror made by crystal. So Emma is in Sanskrit, uh, Yama, and according to Buddhist mythology, Emma is a king of hell. And another one, this is a, a picture that I just uh, took a week ago when I visited um, Buddhist temple. And this is uh, one of my favorite uh, paintings. She was mistakenly sent to hell. So the Emma looks like perplex. And maybe she should uh, send to the better place. Uh, so, but this person seems to be a um, uh, sinner, sinner, one of the sins. So this is karma scale and also uh, karma mirror. So 42nd day, um, there's a 42nd day because of time I skipped some um, explanation, 49th day. This is the last day for the dead. And there's also 100 days after this. Uh, one sin is slightly reduced if his or her descendants offer a service for the dead. 
and also ninth hall of hell and tenth hall, uh, tenth hall of hell, a third death anniversary. Uh, Godo ten ningo. So the eight things corresponding to the eight hells, not harming, not stealing, these uh, five precepts, plus number six, those who have long view, that means uh, ignorant uh, beings who deny the karmic law, and number seven, those who sexually assault, sexually assault the nuns, and number eight, those who commit uh, father and mother and killing uh, monks. So uh, these are how uh, eight sins corresponding to the eight hells. Okay. And I do not read all of this, but as you can see, each um, when one breaks a precept, it's corresponding to the hell. And the number eight is the worst one. So this is a, a image that I create. So this is where we live. And number one, two, three, four, five. These are the same size, so same space. But the last one, the eighth one is larger and more space. And it is called Mugen Jigoku or Abi Jigoku in Japanese. This is the last one. So number one, the hell of the first one is a hell of repetition called Togazu Jigoku. So the sinners in this place are always bent upon injuring one another. So even in this world, they killed each other. So the flesh and bones, uh, blood comes out and bones are exposed. So this is the first hell. And the second hell is a hell of black lobe. These are uh, hell wardens and these are sinners. So the hell wardens is the sinners and uh, flying them face down and made by a uh, hot iron. So that is uh, the meaning of black lobe. So wife and children, brothers and sisters or relatives are all of them unable to save the person. And the third one is the hell of assembly. So this is known as a forest of sword graves. So when the man look at the tree, there was a very beautiful woman he once loved. So uh, he tried to, with joy, he tried to climb up the tree However, when he reached the tree, the women is now go to the ground. She is sitting on the ground. So he climbed down and going to the ground. And then she now, when he look at the tree, now she's on the top of the tree. So this is debated for 10 trillion, trillion years. The women says, because of karma caused by my passion for you, I have come to this place. Why do you? come and embrace me, but he cannot do so. Always uh, when he look at the tree and climb the tree, she is now come to the uh, ground. So it is a uh, blade uh, swords. So the number four are uh, the hell of limitations. So uh, this is also uh, the hell warden is very powerful and their powerful voices can pierce the sinners, just like arrows. So the fifth one is a hell of great limitation. So this is uh, when a person tell a lie, the hell warden uh, pulls the leg, uh, pulls the tongue because of the um, sinful act. So the language is very important. When, uh, so telling a lie, it's thought to be worst. The number seven is a hell of a scorching heat, shown as jigoku. So human, like a human barbecue, they, the hell warden turning them over uh, both to cook um, both sides. And number seven is a hell of a scorching heat. Uh, it is also uh, very powerful and fire. And it takes a long time and all of the hell very similar, but for example, the seventh is a 10 times greater than the combined sufferings of the other uh, six hells. And the end to eight one is a hell of no interval. So there's nothing but frames and the sky is dark 
and all space is filled with evil people. There's nothing, nothing can rely on. And uh, the person says, I am within the darkness of this evil realms and will enter the mass of flames. In the sky, I can see neither the sun, no moon, no the stars. And this is a traditional painting of the eighth one. So again, uh, wrapping up, hungry ghost, uh, actions done with an impure mind, affected by greed, ill will, grudge, and so forth, result in unhappy lives like those of hungry ghost and hell beings. But there's some hope because there's a dissolve that who help all of the people in the six realms. So um, dissolve that means uh, earth treasure. So there's a hope even in hell. So human birth, um, regarding human birth, uh, actions done with pure mind, motivated by generosity, love, and so forth, result in happy realms, like human realm. So um, we have spiritual ancestors and biological ancestors. So all people can learn from their spiritual ancestors, regardless of their religious traditions. And I'm a Buddhist and I'm a Zen Buddhist sort of school, um, but I can learn from other religions, uh, people regarding spiritual ancestors. So when we respect our blood ancestors and our spiritual ancestors, we feel rooted. If we can find ways to cherish and develop our spiritual heritage, will be avoid the kind of alienation that is destroying society and will become whole again. So we must encourage others, especially when people go back to the, their traditions and they discover the jewels uh, that are there. This is Tikunak as well. Okay, so uh, this is my presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, we can share our um, our appreciation by waving. This is kind of online applause, Zoom applause. This is what it looks like. But this is our applauding you. Um, thank you so much for sharing that very fascinating uh, uh, presentation and all the beautiful and difficult, but also beautiful artwork that you shared with us as well. Um, and and I, I'm sure I'll get to sleep tonight. It might take me a little longer than usual, but um, <laughs> but I'm, 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 I'm hopeful. Um, if anybody has any questions, since um, I don't see any questions in the chat quite yet, um, you feel free also to go ahead and raise your hand if you would like to share one out loud, or you can go ahead and put it in the chat as well. But we have time, we'll take one question. Uh, oh, Eileen, when are the children introduced to these realms? Um, at what age? Um, oh, so, there's a uh, etoki pict uh, pictorial uh, sermon. So children at a very early age, such as um, early elementary school children uh, learn about this story. So sometimes they feel very scary and cry, but mm. it is important to teach children about morality at an early stage in our life. Mm. So even though it is scary, it is so to be important to show this kind of images. I had a quick question. Does in this under in Mahayana Buddhism, does everyone go through some sort of hell? Is it some like does everybody have to go through like is it more of a almost a, a period of trial? And it depends and what version of hell you go through depends on your karma or does everybody or are there people who can avoid it altogether? Um, the trial, uh, all people uh, who die uh, go to the trial, but mm. it depends on one's karma. So uh, you can go to a very good place like a devas, the good place or uh, leave us as a human being. So only who break the precept uh, goes to hell such as hungry ghost and also uh, hell. So if you're a good person, you do not, um, you never go to the hell. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Well, thank you so much. Um, you. Let's see. A we question from me. Yeah, maybe one more. This is Julia asked, what, 
how is this teaching related with the act of harakiri? Harakiri um, is sunrise, yes, ritual to kill himself. So from the, there's a um, paradox. So it is not thought to be good, even uh, killing oneself. However, the culture, uh, just like we have soldiers in this um, contemporary society, some lie were put uh, there, it was their obligation uh, to fight for their looter. So um, maybe it's a person who product, uh, who commit harakiri, we do not go to the desirable livers because uh, somehow he killed himself. Mm. But as a society, it was permitted at the time. So there's a contradiction between the samurai's norm of conduct and also Buddhist thought. But it combined and melted together in society. Mm. That's a very interesting question, I think. Thank you for very much for raising interesting question. Thank you again, Nanako. And we are we're 27 past the hour, so it looks like we're, we're more or less maybe a minute or two off, but otherwise we're doing pretty good, I think. So, Paul, <laughs> we are, we're counting on you here. Um, I know that you have um, a presentation to give, and again, we'll give some a little bit of time for a question or two after that. So, and I, and just so you know, I might have to get up here. I'm, I'm kind of playing double duty with my with parenting right now. So if I get up, I promise I'm listening. I have headphones so I can hear everything going on, even if I get up. So um, I'm just, I, but, uh, and hopefully I will be able to be quick, um, but I don't want you to think I'm being rude. <laughs> I'm still listening, but thank you so much, Paul. Um, please take it away. Yeah, thank you. And good to be in conversation with y'all and learning together in this space. Then Almitra spoke saying, we would ask now of death. And he said, if you would indeed behold the spirit of death, open your heart wide unto the body of life. For life and death are one, even as the river and the sea are one. When last fall faded into winter at the School for Theology and Ministry at Seattle U, I received an email. For one thing, the spiritual discernment class I was scheduled to teach is canceled. And for another thing, internship and integration, a different course that I hadn't taught before, needs a new instructor. And can it be you? In the first quarter, the dynamic between the faculty and students became too problematic in this class. The train broke down and needed a new conductor. The breakdown, I was told, stemmed from how the instructor's Christianity held the space in a grip that felt too Christian even for the Christians. Part of me, as I'm reading this, part of the time, damn, or dang. I prepared a lot for spiritual discernment. Another part of me, another part of the time. Someone kind, please bathe me in some warm water. I looked at the class roster and saw a few students that had thrown some destructive arrows into my heart. Another part of me, if we wanna keep a slab of ends meat on the table, we need to teach this class. Another part of me, this is a class I'm qualified for, skilled to facilitate and can love tenderly for our more than human world. Another part of me, also in the book of Isaiah, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. Richard Swartz is a founder of Internal Family Systems or IFS. This emergent therapeutic practice is derived from Swartz's listening deeply to clients describe different parts of themselves and the transformation that occurred when parts were attended to with curiosity and compassion. In the world of IFS, the human person is alive with parts and they all mean well and are good and pregnant with potential. Trauma though hurts parts that can become hurtful, burdened, and stuck. 
the goal of IFS is not to banish parts of ourselves into the shadows, which is sadly counterintuitive. The goal rather is to bring parts into liberative harmony and help people live with greater frequency in what's called the eight C's, calmness, creativity, clarity, curiosity, courage, compassion, and connectedness. Though I am not a devotee of IFS, it is a practice I found helpful to practice with a therapist and think with in the classroom. So I began preparing for internship and integration by noticing different parts of myself for what I think of as compassionate interaction. I began by seeing that students, even the ones with handy arrows, have parts too and may appreciate practices that help them facilitate compassionate interaction as well. What does it mean to become a good ancestor and co-create? How can we teach for the future when things are falling apart in the present? Here's my first proposal. We must begin by tending the diverse complex world within and bring to the fore pedagogies of mind that scatter good seed in our inner landscapes. Parker Palmer, as we know, said it well, we teach who we are and the human heart is the source of good teaching. A second proposal, a pedagogy for the future must be a humble but differentiated student of living and local more than human histories. Seattle U was founded in 1891. Its mission is to educate the whole person to professional formation and empower leaders for a more just and humane world. It began as a primary school in a rented church that served just 90 children. And the faculty were holy named sisters and a handful of Jesuits. The city of Seattle uh, itself was established 40 years before in 1851. And Seattle is taken from an indigenous chief who was a leader known for negotiating between different tribes and white colonists. He gave one of the most beautiful, prophetic, and heartbreaking speeches I've read after the Washington governor announced the inevitability of indigenous land loss. And it concluded, the white man will never be alone. Let him deal just and kindly with my people for the dead are not altogether powerless. St. Ignatius Chapel at Seattle U was designed by Steve Hall in collaboration with students around the concept of a gathering of different lights, which is meant to facilitate the school's spiritual and academic life. And currently there are eight schools at Seattle U, but after next academic year, a transformative gathering place for different lights will sadly go out the School for Theology and Ministry will close. In a recent meeting with STM faculty, our provost referred to the closure of STM as a death experience, which brought to mind the first question I asked the department as a core faculty member. What will it mean to die together in a beautiful way? Graduate theological education began at SU as a summer program in the transformative years of the 1960s. From its inception, it labored to birth lived faith shepherded by wisdom traditions, grounded in a laboratory of ecumenical dialogue for social healing. Raymond Hunthausen, the youngest bishop to participate in Vatican II, is experienced as an ancestor hero. When the sun began to set on STM, there were six graduate degrees and professional certificate programs. Over 17 religious traditions were represented. And today over 2,200 alumni work in various capacities for a more humane and just world. But on July or June 30th, 2020, students and faculty were notified that a committee determined that the school needed to close. One rationale was that the school had operated at a significant loss for more than three consecutive years. 
months before the announcement, the country's, uh, the country's economy shut down due to COVID. A month before that, George Floyd was murdered in the daylight by a Minneapolis police officer, which caused protests all over the country, including a block from SU's campus where the notorious Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone or CHAZ was formed. The news of STM's future death came as a shocking wound and some things started falling apart. Students felt betrayed, like the university had given up too soon and sold their values down the Duwamish River. Though no one ever said it, it also seemed to me that the news announced an unannounced death of a certain kind of love in our world. In a community discussion about the closure of STM, former Dean Mark Marcooley said that in addition to operating at a million dollar loss shouldered by the university, STM's closure had to do with culture. And as a theological anthropologist, these, this comment struck me as a kind of playground worth playing in. Of course, we're not surprised that graduate theological education is suffering. Schools across the country have closed, are closing now, and are merging. Likely all are positioning themselves for what Daniel Ashire calls the next future of theological education. Our culture is more likely to be looking for a therapist and a Netflix series than a priest and a church. In my ethnographic field work on the spiritual lives of people living on the streets of Seattle, I found that rejecting religion and Christianity in particular to be like the birth of a new and life-giving spirituality. Some of the street kids that I spent time with developed street personas after religion's anti-heroes like Lucifer and Lilith, and they considered themselves Luciferians. Like Howard Thurman in, the, in Jesus and the Disinherited, Charles Taylor demonstrates that humans need a place of power to stand in the world and that religion has become less a less powerful place for many to stand. And this is a story about religious decline that is often told around our cultural fireplaces. But I wanna think about a new story. The story I wanna tell is about how a divine love that lives and moves and has its being in progressive politics and persons, which is generated in places like STM, is experienced as dying. So this is a story about the death of a school and the perceived death of a justice loving, more than human spirit. In my view, STM has been engaged in a larger cultural struggle for the definition of religion and the gods that birth religion, which is too often defined as conservative and bigoted. Part of what STM has been doing is creating persons and social spaces, I think, where a divine lover who loves through progressive politics might show up transformatively. What does it mean to become a good ancestor and co-create for the future? How can we teach uh, with the future when things are falling apart now? My third proposal, which is more of a research question to be lived experimentally than an answer to be given, is that we explore whether a feared death of divine love is a beat in the heart of the destructiveness in our culture and in our classrooms. Put differently, my third proposal is a provocation that we allow love to be our mortician in the present and a midwife for the future. Then a plowman said, speak to us of work. You work that you may keep pace with the earth and the soul of the earth. And what is it to work with love? It is to weave the cloth with the threads of dawn from your heart as if your beloved were to wear that cloth. It is to build a house with affection, even as if your beloved were to dwell in that house. It is to sow seeds with tenderness and reap the harvest with joy, even as your beloved were to eat that fruit. It is to charge all things you fashion with a breath of your own spirit and to know that all the blessed dead are standing about you watching. 
In Waiting for God, Simone Weil writes that love in all its fullness is being able to look at another person and ask, what are you going through? And the look is as crucial as the query. Both are meant to liberate the other from limiting preconceptions so that the other can emerge to you in a freedom and a hospitable presence might be co-created. With Vey in mind, I began engaging students in this class with a simple question. What do you need from this class? How can I be helpful to you? And this is the third step that I took in my course design after noticing different parts of myself and thinking critically about what matters in this situation. Um, I can't say, of course, uh, for the sake of confidentiality, what I heard back from the students, but I can tell you that three themes emerged. They needed a space to reflect, reflect freely about their own experiences at STM and at their internship site. They needed to be an open conversation with their peers, and they needed a space to practice the skills that they learned over the course of their program. After this deep listening and consulting with professors, some of them here so kindly, and theorists uh, that I appreciate, I drafted a course that consisted of the following elements, and I'm wrapping up here pretty soon. One, easing in with tunes and tea. Two, taking turns creating a grounding or contemplative exercise. Three, a creative reading of Valerie Kaur's fantastic book, See No Stranger some rest, of course, an hour of processing one's internship and or experience at STM that would begin with a journal prompt that students would take turn creating and opening up for discussion. And finally, with a group discernment exercise with photography, where we would notice where we felt being called to life in the present. I proposed the structure to the students on the first day of class and asked if we needed to make any adjustments, which could be done by group consensus. We agreed that the structure was worth experimenting with, and I invited them to be open to a new wind coming into our space and blowing things around in a way that could become more helpful. I think this class created a shared presence that helped us remember what really matters being together in a humble and open spirit of love and freedom for more love and freedom in the world. That this kind of presence helped create the possibility of spiritual and social integration, which is what was at stake in this class. Experimentally, I think we learned the truth of Patrick Reyes's words, that we are called not to manage this moment, but to create the conditions for future generations to thrive. In conclusion, this presentation has explored two interrelated queries. First, how do we become good ancestors through courageous co-creation? And second, how can we teach for the future when things are falling apart in the present? These queries have been situated, as you know, in the ongoing death experience of STM, the larger context of secularization and an internship and integration class that I facilitated. And I made four proposals. First, a pedagogy with the future should begin by tending the diverse complex worlds within ourselves and bringing to the fore pedagogies of mind that can scatter good seed in our inner landscape. Second, I propose that a pedagogy with the future be a humble, a differentiated student of living and local more than human histories where we understand what really matters. My third proposal, which is more of a research question, is that we explore whether a feared death of divine love is a beat in the heart of our cultural and classroom destructiveness. And as a result, fourth and finally, I propose that we allow love to be our mortician in the present and our midwife in the future. Khalil Gibran uh, in The Prophet has been our sort of poet prophet into a clear thesis. If we work with love and for love by letting a greater more than human love do its work, 
Perhaps we can sow seeds in the present that will bloom into something beautiful. With trust in this steady and yet gentle presence of divine love, which we can have faith will be reborn even when it seems to be dying. We can become freer to love the future and be courageous co-creators as things fall apart in the future. And so paradoxically, hope flies into the future on the wings of a beautiful death. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Paul. We're applauding you over Zoom. Thank you again so much. And I see, think I already see a question. One, yes, from Mary. I'm curious whether some of the more creative experiences of scholarship at this meeting might be filling some of the open space the, and the longing you're articulating with your students. And I too love Valerie Core's work and I echo that myself. Um, I'm also wondering whether some of the work that Shelley Rambo has done on Holy Saturday might be applicable here. So if there's anything there, Paul, that strikes you that you'd like to respond to. Um, other than uh, thank you so much. Um, I hadn't <laughs> thought about um, Shelley Rambo's work on Holy Saturday in relation to this kind of class. And um, uh, I'll definitely be attentive to some of the more creative experiences of scholarship at this meeting and, and be thinking about that. Um, yeah. I wish I had something better to say other than thank you, and I'm going to look okay. into that. That's well, good. And I want to say I, too, share your grief at what's happened with mm. STM at Seattle U, because I had the privilege of teaching there in the summers, and mm. I, I miss it greatly. Yeah. Thank you, Mary. And thank you for your help in talking about the class. <laughs> Very good. I was interested. Oh, Chuck has a hand up. Let's let Chuck uh, go ahead and ask a question. Hi, Paul. Thank you for your paper and your reflection. And sorry about the school closing. I just saw the documentary last night, How Satan. And that's a documentary which capitalizes and, and piggybacks on the homeless youth describing themselves as Luciferians. And the whole idea behind the documentary is reinterpreting Satan as the great adversary against social injustice and against the evil that's been perpetrated by religious institutions and the religious hypocrisy or the religious corruption that is uh, being rejected in large part by many people who aren't finding meaning in the narratives, the customs, the rituals of Christianity. Uh, so uh, after seeing that and, and reading your words uh, about the youth of Seattle, the homeless youth, youth of Seattle, you know, I, I just see part of what's going on as this um, revolution and rebellion against uh, evil or against the bottom line and losing something that ultimately um, closes because of a bottom line that doesn't fully appreciate the history that this school has produced. Um, you know, in some ways similar to RE programs that are closing in different schools uh, and ending the tradition of, that's part of our guild. Um, so. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for your paper. And if you want yeah. to comment on that, feel free to add comments to what I just said. Um, no, just thank you for your comments and observation. I'm, uh, I haven't i have yet seen that documentary. I think it's on Hulu, Hell, Hell Satan. Um, and a lot of the Luciferians that I spent time with would have really said amen uh, to a mm. lot of words and observation. It, it is, I think, a liberatory practice for them. And um, in fact, I think a form of attuned care uh, mm. that helps empower them in a really disempowering local world. Um, so yeah, I, I would like to think about um, seeing that as, as a form of folks caring for each other. Uh, but there, there are of course many different frames one could put to it. And yeah, would love to talk with you further sometime, Chuck, thank you. Well, um, I know there's probably more questions. I, I have my list here, actually, um, but I'm going, we're going to make sure we keep moving and we will still have space. We want to make sure that we have space at the end for more questions. And when we do, you can address them to specific speakers, but we can also have a more broad uh, interaction between the three different ideas. 
but I, two things that came up in Paul's conversation about internal family systems and also this conversation about tuned care, um, I think are both resonant with, uh, with CJ's work. So um, we'll let that be a segue into, into, into CJ's presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Josh. Thank you to my co-presenters. Um, fascinating papers and presentations, learned much, um, so thank you. My gratitude to the organizers of this annual session. The topic of ancestors is of utmost importance as we consider resistance in light of the consistent political juridical setbacks, which I see as part of the cycle of domination upon domination all around the world, right? Not least in the United States. My paper urges us to consider ancestors of all kinds, even ones we would rather not summon or remember. Often when we speak of ancestors, we default to loved to human loved ones or cherished ones, that is to parents, grandparents, or others of consequence in our lives or in the community. On a social scale, the memories of past leaders are brought up, often with accompanying anecdotes as to why those leaders deserve recognition in the present. I am willing to bet that each of us here can remember at least one account or accounts of a decedent close to you, your family, or community, both secular and religious. And many of these accounts might also differ and conflict. Of course, I do not wish to discount such narratives or memories, for they can provide us with fortitude and or inspiration to face and overcome seemingly insurmountable obstacles. The dangerous memories that Met spoke about are certainly necessary to rouse us from complacencies of all kinds in order to rethink our positions and identities and to engage in personal and social actions toward resistances of all kinds. But it is also crucial to expand our imagination and talk of ancestors, particularly in light of continual mass senseless suffering and death. To complicate any concept, however sacred, is to seek new possibilities, more prospects for what could be. It's to think otherwise. Multiplicity and shards, or the term now once again in vogue, the once avant-garde fragments. These are my methodologies for all my thought experiments. Thought experiments, of course, that stem from embodied realities, some of which remain rather static, but most, I must confess, which shift with the seasons or even with the ticks of each fleeting minute. In order to allow ancestors of all kinds to manifest, we should be open to hauntings. The term haunting certainly conjures images of cemeteries, scary movies, Halloween, of course. Spooky and spine tingling might be apt adjectives for the event of a haunt. But one need not delve into the worlds of spirits to experience a haunting. The soil itself harbors the spilled blood and broken bones of past generations of both human, non-human beings. The land is infused with ancestral relics and specters. Like Golgotha, for example, the land we now live on is a site of multiple and ongoing crucifixions, a scene of ontological terror and unjustified senseless mass death and suffering. And utopian dreams of a more equal and just society where all bodies can live and thrive seem ever out of reach within this necropolitical landscape that grants states the right to organize and police mortality via biopower. My question is, are we haunted by deaths of all kinds? Death is everywhere at all times. Far from being a fact meant to elicit fear, such realization might liberate a self stuck in pretensions of a settled, eternal even, self. It might also lead selves, especially those under the illusion of being self-made, to see that all life, all existence, always comes at the cost of other life. You and I are here because other life has given and continues to give us life. Think of the flesh you consume on a daily basis, or a vegetarian of the plants you deprive other life forms of. From the moment of birth to death, all bodies participate in competition for resources that nourish, embellish, or provide social status. Some bodies consume a large share of the world's resources, resulting in vast amounts of waste and the deprivation of others near survival. So an uncomfortable reality always arises. 
a question rather, is innocence ever possible, even for human infants? Realization of complicity in death for survival is certainly uncomfortable, especially for those of us who see our lives as peaceful or as engaged in fights for justice and equality. Consistent deaths of self are therefore essential to bodies always on the move to the final physical death. So ancestors can manifest in many shapes and forms, though the dead, especially victims of injustice, can serve as reminders to the living of past events. One's self can become a ghost and ancestor that reminds the present self to remain unsettled and always open to a multitude of possibilities, even in the most constricted of scenarios. Past life forms and past selves serve as constant reminders that deaths of all kinds are inescapable and ever present, notwithstanding attempts to sanitize life and avoid the specter of rotting flesh. This presentation seeks to expand how we as educators envision and speak of ancestors. It does so by considering the multifaceted and elusive forms that ancestors as ghosts can take, including ghosts of one's past selves, what I am calling ontological ancestors. Why ontological ancestors? That is, why the need to remember past selves? To begin to grapple with this question, let's consider some contexts or disciplinary technologies or regimes under which bodies currently exist I note in the paper that these contexts or technologies themselves should haunt our daily existences, for they subject bodies to systems of worth and value that exclude the vast majority of bodies from the top echelons that comprise full humanity and full personhood. I have described these as ontological terror, brilliantly elaborated on by Calvin Warren and Frank Wilderson, two main proponents of Afro-pessimism, biopower and biopolitics, as described by Michel Foucault, and necropolitics, as developed by Achille Membe in an article and book by the same title. I provide more elaborate descriptions of these systems or regimes in the paper for our session. For now, allow me to adumbrate some principal questions and concepts posed by these contexts. First, regarding ontological terror, Calvin Warren asks, quote, can black things become free? What is the, the status of such beings?" End quote. Warren would answer no to the first and would suggest that Blacks are inherently something other than a human being. His entire project, quote, challenges the claim that Blacks are human and can ground existence in the same being of the human. End quote. This is a similar claim now being made by Indigenous, uh, the School of Indigenous Pessimism also. As a paradoxical and non-being entity, the black body cannot be implotted within a metaphysical humanistic framework or even understood within the, the Euro-Christian concept of Imago Dei. Language of human dignity and rights is therefore empty rhetoric, fueling cruel optimism in a world of colonial difference sustained by metaphysical fantasies of hierarchical and categorical existences, of a world haunted by specters of bodies deemed non-existent or if existent, as fodder, as ghosts in the machine. Second, biopower. Foucault urges us to complexify our concepts of power. He points out that when, we, when he speaks of power, or when he spoke of power, people immediately think of a political structure, a government, a dominant social class, the master slave, and so on. It is a common misconception that power operates only in binaries. The co this common script limits potential responses and resistances to another set of binaries or scripts. You revolt, you vote, you protest, you become a politician, you join the grassroots struggle, etc. The vertical understanding of power also assumes a singular center and its margins, but power creates several centers and margins with margins within margins. Categories of exclusion and inclusion therefore require consideration in light of more complex understandings of how power manifests. So why do we focus on one form of power, that is the political, juridical, or sovereign form? Perhaps because it is more visible and older than the other. With origins in the Middle Ages, Foucault observes that one of the characteristic privileges of sovereign power was the right to decide life and death. We're familiar with these, 
crucifixions, beheadings, burning at the stakes, pressing to death, and forms of modern capital punishment are all quite visible examples of the sovereign's seemingly unilateral power over subjects that violate the state's will. But Foucault identifies another form of power with origins in the 17th century during times of colonization, and that's biopower. So rather than exercise power through the ability to kill or to refrain from killing, biopower exerts its power through the management of life toward optimal and predictable societal outcomes. Quote, the old power of death that symbolized sovereign power was now carefully supplanted by the administration of bodies and the calculated management of life, end quote, says Foucault. Biopower depends on two interrelated techniques, discipline of individual bodies and control of the population, with both working in tandem to normalize bodies and behaviors that are then conducive to societal homeostasis or equilibrium. A few shifts to note with biopower on the scene. The body passed from being only a legal subject or object beholden to sovereign power or to church power to now a living subject whose whole body and existence are game for various techniques of power that could intervene when threats to normalization appear. Biopower is thus a continuous regulatory and corrective mechanism that exceeds law's control over the self. All life, even one's internal thoughts, is now power's prerogative and not simply a life in relation to the state or one's duty to the sovereign. Foucault continues, quote, such a power has to qualify, measure, appraise, rather than display itself in its murderous splendor. It does not have to draw the line that separates the enemies of the sovereign from his obedient subjects. It affects distributions around the norm, end quote. It can do this without much noise or attention, such as when a judgmental gaze, for example, at a gay couple holding hands in public elicits from the pair shame, anger, or pride. Thus, the living who occupy the several distributions themselves contribute to and wield power over others for both ill and good, perpetuating certain norms and also offering sites of resistance. This brings us to the third context, necropolitics. Western rationality and its techniques find their expression in the synthesis between massacre and bureaucracy. Sovereignty, according to Achille Membe, now means the capacity to define who matters and who does not, who is disposable and who is not. Killing of the disposable serves to manage life so as to enhance it. Filtering and categorizing bodies based on perceived worth or value sets the stage for the necropolitical world, a world of marked differences and tight but yet fluid boundaries where there are, quote, different rights for different categories of people, rights with different goals, but existing within the same space, end quote. So death is balanced with life, with both visible and invisible deaths occurring at every moment, hauntings everywhere at all times. So now the million dollar question, how should we as religious educators and theologians respond? One possibility, by becoming ancestors to ourselves at all times, especially at moments of certainty, this is possible through a consistent reconstitution of self from all available shards or fragments. Imagining identity as something comprehensible, graspable, and progressive with some telos gels cogently with the obsession to categorize necropolitically in order to filter between what is useful and what is waste, between who matters and who matters less in social relationships and within the global economy. So what if we strip talk of human nature or essence? What if selves can reframe themselves through words and deeds, rewriting and rewiring? It follows from this that we can and do inhabit multiple identities depending on locations and gazes. For example, think of code switching. The result is that, quote, each day we make ourselves anew in fresh formulations. Each day we can re-haunt ourselves rather than search for imagined established selves perceived as now scattered or lost. Memory is fragmented. It is not the tool used to make us whole, for the past is romanticized to fit current needs or desires for a route, for a trajectory, for a life's plan and purpose in hindsight. Likewise, 
desires for a romanticized past can actually be mechanisms to avoid the ongoing hauntings of the present, to turn away from the horrors amid flux, chaos, and precarity. While remembering can be essential to forging new selves, remembrance, as Mayra Rivera writes, is, quote, threatened by the tendencies to objectify the past or construe history as a foundation of reified identities and hyper certainties, end quote. In the paper, I suggest a form of deep self-care called escasis that requires a consistent undoing of any settled self. Of course, an arduous, an arduous task that will never reach completion. It is an ongoing grappling with a self unable to ever fully liberate itself from power's multiplicitous grasps. So rather than seek liberation along some political juridical landscape that is too intertwined with colonial matrices of power and concerns about the worth and value of bodies vis-a-vis -a, -vis a rigged power game, why not allow ourselves to be haunted by looming and persistent cleavings? Can these allow the self to conceptualize its own fragility and woundedness in ways that might perhaps challenge dominant narratives of settled selves? A question to us all, what apertures can theology and religious education provide to facilitate the present selves haunting and dislodging from fascist, fanatical, and totalitarian tendencies, from hyper-certainties that seek to shield bodies from possible hauntings of all sorts. What spiritual practices can we consider? In the paper, I consider a few, um, particularly from Marguerite Poirier. Um, I really, her mirror of simple souls, I think, for example, is um, quite the anecdote to the more rigid stages of faith development. Vulnerability is key to occupying feral and unpredictable spaces, haunted by all types of ghosts, even unpleasant ones. Opening portals to these spaces will allow the self to feel with intensity the hauntings from the several past reconfigurations of shards that will never ossify into a perfect mirror. Broken glass everywhere. Stare long enough at the shards and one might just see a transient image of what never was but what could be. The body will eventually perish from exhaustion and will become a ghost, a shadow of itself, able to commune with new selves and with disposed bodies that continue to haunt while they themselves are incapable of being haunted again. To be haunted is a gift and a responsibility one has to ancestors of all kinds. If we hope to be responsible, and I refrain from using good, if we hope to be responsible ancestors to a new generation trapped, as Tupac would say, within the loops of ontological terror, biopower, and necropolitics, Hauntings offer possibilities for fleeting escapes from the loop through ongoing reconstitutions of selves. May we pray to be haunted. Thank you. We give our applause once again for CJ. Thank you so much for this um, very rich and uh, uh, presentation that we've just got to hear from you. And I'd like an opportunity to open the floor once again and uh, for maybe a question or two before we then have spend the rest of our time um, interacting with all three and with each other. Many kudos in the, in the chat. Looking for any hands up or any hands. Here we go, Eileen. A comment on internal family systems approach to psychological counseling. It's almost predicated on such ghosts continuing to haunt. Um, haunt one. Yes. Um, feel free to respond to that if you so if uh, if you have anything to add to that, CJ. But I, think, uh, I just enjoyed seeing the overlap among the papers um, and and the possibilities, and of course some divergences. But 
um, overall, you know, I just want to thank everyone again for a rich conversation. Absolutely. Well, I guess we can just, we can open the floor and I guess maybe to start from that point, as you were saying, if, you know, we don't want to uh, reduce the three papers in say that they are all the same or are touching the same things. In fact, they're quite uh, different in the way that they approach things, obviously. But um, I, you know, maybe if just looking at the way in which we're talking about ancestors or what the role of ancestors is and the uh, implications of that for religious education, you know, for me, you know, at least from my perspective, hearing in Nanako's conversation, just the role of the religious imagination, the role of spiritual and religious imagination and how that forms and shapes us. Um, and how do we pass along that imagination? How do we stimulate that imagination um, was something that was coming up at for me as I was listening. Um, and maybe, and that that being a role of ancestors or the way in which we understand ancestors is through these really rich stories. Um, through, uh, through Paul's presentation, it almost, it's almost as if we are becoming the ancestors. We are the ancestors now and finding ways of creating and um, creating and uh, situated practices within where we are at and trying to make meaning in, a, in the future as, as it happens. And there was a bit of that also in your presentation, CJ, um, but also the idea there, ancestors in terms of haunting, which it's um, not just a passing down of a tradition, but it's also the breaking apart of that tradition, the question, calling into question that tradition, the, um, the, the uh, it's awakening us from fantasy as opposed to just uh, you know, that and, and that, that being the role somehow. And so, and, and both you and Paul, both CJ and Paul are touching on this idea of being ancestors to ourselves and tapping into that, which I, which Eileen just brought up this idea of internal family systems. Um, and, and I saw, saw this, the same connection there with CJ obviously is, is this ability to be able to, um, to be ancestors to ourselves and, and thinking about this in terms of a situated self care and a kind of an ongoing ad hoc self discovery piece that's happening as well. So there are all these different layers of what, what it means to be an ancestor, what it means to be, rooted in our ancestors. Um, I think we've been blessed here in this conversation with a number of different lenses on which to approach that idea. So we could tackle those ideas or anything else you heard or any other connections that you heard through the conversation. Um, feel free as speakers, if you have questions for your fellow colleagues, feel free to, to, to fire away. Um, we have about uh, 17 more minutes um, where, we can, uh, where we can share. I see a, is, do I see a hand, I think, from Paulus, if you would like to share. Okay, thank you for this opportunity, and I appreciate about the presentation from Balde, uh, from Kesar. Do you sing uh, Michel Puko? Uh, I hope my connection is good. Is my voice clear? Yes. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, because when we use the bio power and bio uh, bio power and biopolitic, I can it can be connected with the uh, the situation about the book in the wheel of to knowledge and especially for the first who have the knowledge can be uh, dominate to a person who, uh, who don't have a knowledge. I think this is a, a good a good discussion can be embraced in this situation to be a good assessors, especially to forming religious education. And when we talk about the biopolitics and by powers, I think it can be correlated with uh, this abilities discourse because uh, there are a serious problem from philosophical perspective when we see the discussion about her argument from uh, Michel Foucault and many interpret her uh, to see about Foucault thinking to connect it with Foucault uh, governmentally and critical disability theory. This is, can be correlated to be how to be good ancestors and to forming a religious education to next generation in the now 
or in the future. I think this is an enlarged topic to make uh, this discussion can be enriched. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Paulus. Yeah, and to respond to that, um, you know, um, I, I absolutely, I think you're right. I think this can enrich the conversation of ancestors and forms of resistance as well, um, as, as selves reconstitute and try to escape the grasps of, for example, neoliberalism. Um, of course, knowing that we we're going to default anyways. So it's 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 about those fleeting apertures, those moments. What can we do within those those bubbles before we're recaptured by by the disciplinary gazes? And to your point about knowledge, I think um, you know Foucault was right. I think when he says the point is not to collect knowledge just to have it, it's to cut it right. So you grab knowledge and then you you cut it up, you fragment it, and then you look for new reconfigurations for that knowledge. And this is where the role of imagination becomes crucial. And I think theological imagination in particular has a role to play here, um, if freed from the constraints though of the modern discourses and narratives um, that, that they unfortunately find themselves trapped with, within many times. Um, so yeah, thank you for your comment. Anybody else feel free to jump in, or if you would rather uh, share it in the chat, I am happy thank to you, be here. Uh, thank you, Josh. Thanks, I think Josh. about uh, Nanako's uh, presentation and how our Christian eschatology of heaven, hell, and purgatory is so basic and simple compared to the many levels within Buddhism, and, and also keeping in mind that Buddhism is coming out of a non-theistic uh, belief system, so we're not even entertaining the concept of God in Buddhist eschatology, uh, we're dealing with karma. And um, one of the things I like Nanako is that the afterlife and time in the different levels of hell is not permanent. Uh, it's a little bit more permanent in the Christian concept of hell, the idea of burning eternally in the fires of hell. Purgatory is more of a, of a process thought, process in the after, afterlife that's more dynamic. Um, but I, I was also wondering about how uh, Dante's uh, Inferno captures these different levels of hell with these different kinds of suffering and whether Dante was inspired or influenced by these Buddhist understandings of hell and also the Jain understandings of hell because Jainism has a similar many different levels of hell. Um, and, and that's just a thought. I don't know whether anybody has ever spoken with Dante about that to see if he, if he was influenced by the Buddhist concepts of, of hell or Jainism. Do you have any connections or understanding of the different levels of hell found in Jainism? And given the fact that Jainism uh, somewhat preceded Buddhism, do you think there's some connection there between the levels of hell and Jainism and Buddhism? Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think there's a connection between Jainism and Buddhism because these two religions are almost the same time. And also, I think it's not Genshin's original. It comes from Chinese Buddhism and Chinese Buddhism took the idea from uh, India. That means Hinduism. And also there's an uh, influence of Zoroastrianism, uh, which worship after the Matsuda. Uh, the notion of hell maybe comes from Zoroastrianism mm -hmm. and also Hinduism. Mm -hmm. And they travel to the notion, travel to China and go to Japan. Mm -hmm. So it's not uh, Genshin's original idea of hell mm -hmm. uh, regarding this um, Ojo Yoshu. Mm -hmm. And so it's just is it found mainly in Mahayana Buddhism or is it found in Theravada or any of the other Buddhist uh, I branches? think this notion of the eight hells, especially which I explained today, is deeply rooted in Mahayana Buddhism. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very thank much. You. Check. We have a quick chat question here from Mary. Um, and I think, uh, CJ, you touched on this a little bit. Um, but question, uh, first a comment, one of my doctoral professors, John McDar, who studied Vips, the Vipassana meditation, my apologies, 
used to talk about how consumerist U.S. culture made them most self-attractive to Americans, but that Buddhist psychology would also point out that you need to be a self in order to lose itself. Is there any resonance here between your sense of haunting and this lack of self amidst neoliberal capitalism? So I think CJ touched on this a bit, and also Nanako might have some thoughts about this as well. And, and Paul too. <laughs> So in, in Technologies of the Self, um, a series of lectures that Foucault gave at uh, the University of Vermont, he touches upon, uh, he upon this subject, especially comparing Freud right, uh, with his own philosophy. So for Freud, the self is this thing that needs to be recovered because it's been lost, especially through traumas in childhood. Um, so it's it's one's life is just a searching for these scattered pieces of the self in order to make oneself whole. Um, and psychoanalysis, of course, uh, followed with perceptions similar to that. Foucault would, would say, well, no, wait a minute. Uh, identity composition is a discursive practice. So however we discipline ourselves or moderate ourselves, that already starts forming a certain identity or self at the moment. And so for him, there is no such thing as human essence or nature. It's just, it is what it is with the contextual measures around us, uh, the disciplinary gazes, et cetera, and how we respond to those. And so what he was looking for were selves, and I agree with him that it, it's, it's reconstitute ourselves ad nauseum and in creative ways to create completely new lifestyles that we just don't know now or can even grasp because we haven't begun the work of um, communal kind of reconstitutions uh, because again it's a very scary journey to say I don't have a settled self or you know um, I don't know where I stand at the moment uh, that's a very uh, it's, it's a very scary thing to say especially in a world again that depends on clear identities clear graspable concepts and that includes concepts of the self can I can I follow up on that for a moment because one of the things it sounds to me like you're kind of interested in the way in which apophatic notions combine with some of this stuff and so I was, I was, I've been doodling around in my head tonight because I'm tired after a long day and thinking about what your response would be when Parker Palmer talks about what it means to stand in the tragic gap and to notice that you're either, your heart's going to be broken. And the question is, is it going to be broken open or broken into shards? Do you think there's a possibility of being broken open? Or is that, or is the Foucaultian notion just so completely almost nihilistic? It's a good question. Um, I think, so I know he would probably push back and say, no, it's not nihilistic. Um, you know, it's it's um, actually in, in a Nietzschean vein, trying to find life where it is and how it is without romanticizing or sanitizing it. And in a way I follow, I also follow that. And I think, you know, um, it has to do with listening to an ancestor, a deep ancestor of mine who's Tupac Shakur, you know? Um, his music as a 12 year old, 13 year old just intuitively spoke to me, um, especially songs like Trapped, for example, you know, um, and, 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 and there's been a tradition of there might not be the possibility of opening anything right things are closed off systems are totalitarian in many ways. And the only hope we have or one of the hopes we have is to embrace the shards embrace the possibility of not existing tomorrow and see what happens from that rather than starting from a viewpoint of there's this hope that I need to get to, um, which in many ways could become a form of cruel optimism. And the Afro-pessimists also speak to that saying that, um, you know, every election, for example, uh, Blacks are mobilized with the hope of some certain gains and then they're forgotten as soon as whoever's in power is in power. And so, so there's this hope in political juridical structures that I'm very suspicious of. And also given my background, um, as an attorney uh, and, and you know, seeing how the justice, the legal system works and you know, the corruption within and all that, it's just, it's very hard to say, I, I, I'm accepting it for openness, especially when I think there are communities and peoples who are already broken and have been broken and will continue to be broken. Um, and they're tired of waiting for openness of others, especially, um, they, they just, they're like, we live in fragments, this is the reality. Let's see what happens if we reconstitute these fragments in several ways. Thank you. That's wonderful. And um, in the chat, I see that um, 
there was a question raised and Nanako responded already. So that's perfect. So I'm asking about Maitreya for anybody who's interested in reading that. So that's wonderful. Um, yeah, I think I'd like to ha have a little time to give our speakers one more final word if they have a chance. Um, if, if nothing else to just to say thank you, but maybe any other thoughts finally as you're hearing people reflect. But any, maybe another question, maybe one more question from folks here. Well, see, I've, I've spoken already too much, but I'm gonna jump <laughs> in again. And maybe it's just because your paper Cesar really um, shook me in some ways, right? So now what I'm curious about is whether you've engaged at all with the work of Adrian Marie Brown and some of the um, kind of cutting edge resistance folk who are talking about joy and pleasure and um, some of that work. Does that, does that shade anything you're doing or? Yeah, thank you so much for that. And um, I have, come across uh, some of their works. Uh, Toni Morrison is somebody that I find uh, fascinating in this regard, because again, she resists kind of the default to let's, you know, let's hope for something. You know, she, she says, she invites us to sit with her novels in despair and anxiety. And again, I think this is the reality for billions of people around the world. They're ready, they, they sit in precarity, they exist in precarity. Um, and I think it's it's incumbent on us, especially for more privileged positions, um, to resist maybe the temptation to say, this is the light at the end of the tunnel, when lives are extinguished each minute for no reason, you know, and, and you can't explain it. Uh, Marcella Altus Reed, the queer theologian, in response to Gustavo Gutierrez's theology of liberation, you know, um, she said that when she would speak to, to women in Argentina whose sons had disappeared, uh, you know, and, and then they were holding books of Gustavo and she, you know, the mothers would say, what use is this? My son is dead. Like, what's the point of this? You know, and I think it's, it's necessary to absolutely to consider the joys, the hopes, but also I think it's time to sit in the despair and the dark night of the soul and really, really confront it and see what happens when we kind of remove hope on a political juridical structure or system out of, you know, when we remove that and just sit, what will happen? What forms of resistance might emerge? Thank you for your, your um, comments. And um, please, if there are any resources you think I should look at, send them my way. I'm just struck also as I'm, I'm thinking about all three of your presentations, how all of them confront us, um, how confrontation is front and center in all of them. How Nanako were confronted with hell, <laughs> or very, which is very, uh, and, and these, and these very rich um, and and potentially, um, you know, uh, you know, gory at times, but also, uh, you know, uh, stories that are confronting us with the realities of karma and the realities of our lives that we that we live and that lives matter and that our lives matter, our physical bodies matter, and what we do matters. Um, and has an effect in the world. And, and, uh, and Paul, the, 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 the pain that people were feeling in the class, um, the people, pain that people were feeling on campus and giving a space, the need to, to make space for people to share that instead of just sweeping it under the rug and, and not paying attention to that. And, and that I hear the parallels with that and what you're talking about with CJ about the, um, about the need to, um, uh, to not immediately um, rush towards the, the, the tying everything up into a bow and making everything pretty again, but also to be able to sit with the pain and the suffering and for those stories to be heard and emerge. So I, I, I think maybe that's something, all, that's something that I'm noticing and hearing here is that role of needing to be confronted by, uh, and that maybe that's what our ancestors are calling us towards. Oftentimes, more often than as much as they maybe offer us comfort and they offer us uh, a path forward in the way of the, um, by, by um, picking up sh uh, fragments of the past and using those as a lens for the future. They may also be asking us to, uh, 
to to break some stuff open and to re-examine it and also just to sit with real life for a little while and and to allow real life to emerge um, and the and the the grittiness of that to be okay uh, and and that to validate that as real experience and and valid experience that has wisdom in it. so anyway that's just just the, the thoughts um I promise to give you all the final word if we have um, a minute. I have just an opportunity to say thank you for the um, and, or any other final thoughts that you have. And um, also before I have a, before I um, do that, just to remind people to do the feedback form, which um, if it's not in the chat, it will be soon. Um, but a uh, reminder to, to, to do your feedback form. That's very helpful for REA. But we'll go backwards this time from CJ to Nanako. So CJ, if you have any final thoughts. Just grateful again for um, the engagement and the questions posed. And um, I always learn from from any pushback. So, um, you know, I really appreciate uh, any challenge to what might perhaps seem as a nihilistic kind of thread running through it. And, and yeah, it's a question I grapple with. And um, sometimes I do feel nihilistic. But again, I think in conversation with many people that I've met, even students, there is this just prevalent sense of nihilism that uh, is not being addressed. And again, I wonder whether the classroom is a setting for that. It's a question that's been posed throughout all presentations. But my project overall is I'm trying to not romanticize or sanitize situations, um, especially again, in view of the constant, consistent, persistent deaths and setbacks and suffering experienced by the vast majority of people around the world. Thank you. Thank you. Paul? Yeah, I just echo the gratitude uh, for being in conversation with y'all and, and living the questions together. This has been a really wonderful and, and generative space. And um, I hope to hope to see you all soon and in person next time. That'd be cool. Awesome. And then Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, if you have any question as I uh, lot in the chat box uh, please send me email anytime regarding a question about uh, not only health but general Buddhist questions. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much send all your health questions to Nanako that's what you said no. <laughs> <laughs> very good thank you all once again for remember to do the surveys and thank you for indulging us three minutes over many many thanks for everybody thank you thank you thank you so much